we must never forget that no government schemes are going to perfect man. We know that living in this world means dealing with what philosophers would call the phenomenology of evil, or as theologians would put it, the doctrine of sin. There is sin and evil in the world, and we're enjoined by Scripture and the Lord Jesus to oppose it with all our might. Coming to you live from the corner of Fauci and Burks on Constitution on Fire Avenue, it's the America Held Hostage Podcast. America's Constitution in Quarantine. Now here are your hosts, Jeff Dornick and John Hinton. Welcome to the America Held Hostage podcast. We've got an old friend back with us for today's program. We'll get to him in just a moment. You can follow me at jhinton underscore on Twitter. Email the podcast at America Held Hostage Podcast at gmail.com. And also we want to tell you to log on to the GK Podcast Network on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play. Find our uh, vast array of podcasts there uh, by uh, Pastor Sam Jones, Dr. Mike Spaulding, our founder, Jeff Dornick, Conversations with Jeff, the Shining Light Podcast, Ask Dr. Mike, and also take a listen and subscribe to our podcast. Leave a five-star review as well. We love to have our digital overlords fix the algorithms and be able to promote that uh, to the masses so that we spread our message far and wide of fighting for a constitutional, conservative, and Christian worldview here on the America Held Hostage podcast. Also, log on to gatekeepersonline.com. There you can check out our plugged-in membership. $10 a month or $100 a year. But if you plug in the promo code John at checkout, you can get a discount. There you will find uh, our book, Social Injustice. Also, you can uh, pre order the book, Five Steps to Kill a Nation by Pastor Sam Jones. You can also find the speeches from our Social Injustice Conference. Uh, that happened last fall, and those are behind our paywall. We'd love for you to be able to see that as well. Uh, Speeches by Jeff Dornick, uh, Sam Jones, and others talking about the social injustice that is, and social justice movement that's happening within the church and the culture and fighting against that. Uh, so take a listen, take a look at gatekeepersonline.com and that's going to be the hub of where we're going to be doing a lot of stuff here and near in the future. Now, coming with us or coming on the program with us is our old co-host Jeff Dornick. Jeff, it's good to have you with us back in the saddle again. Yes, it's it's good to be back. Good to be back. So th- thanks for having me back on. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for making time with us. Jeff has been away. Uh, he is trying to get some things going as he has a lot of time on his hands, or he did, he doesn't anymore because too many people are asking for his help to take America back and to storm the churches. So he's doing a little bit of both. So <laughs> your your days have been busy, as I can tell. Yes, I, I'm pretty much so. So g- getting things going with 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 the GK, making some changes and adjustments on the technical side of things, and how and our layout and all that kind of stuff launching a new podcast network, and then also uh, founding the American conservative movement uh, definitely takes up my time. It's like a full-time job. I feel like I don't sleep anymore. <laughs> yeah, and whenever you do have free time, you have to save it for the wife, which exactly I, uh, I have been uh, the amen corner over here. That's what I call my <laughs> wife over here. She has uh, gotten on to me about uh, – not spending enough time, so I'm having to find a find the right balance. But uh, you know, that's that's what we do as guys. You, it's iron sharpens iron. You have to figure out a balance of how to take your passions and and work them. But you also have a a mission and a message to share. So uh, it doesn't matter if you're sharing that with the masses. If uh, if you don't keep your wife happy, ain't nobody happy. Yep. So our first, our first story today is going to come to us from your neck of the woods 
in Southern California. The ABC affiliate, ABC7, uh, they sent a story you sent to me, but they tweeted it out talking about yesterday how Governor Gavin Newsom was uh, preparing to reopen the state of California into phase two of the reopening. I don't know what these phases are, uh, to be honest. I think that it's much ado about nothing. You should just open the country back up. Gosh dang it. Um, but uh, the story from ABC 7 Eyewitness News in Southern California says that Governor Gavin Newsom announces the next stage of reopening for California's economy as it will begin as early as Friday. Follow that up with an LA Times article that uh, said that some retail stores across the state will be able to reopen with some modifications as early as Friday amid growing pressures to ease the stay-at-home orders, which not coincidentally happens less than a week after people in California went to Huntington Beach and protested and said, we want our country back. Now, there are some thoughts there about the draconian means that the California Highway Patrol and the L.A. County Sheriff's Department were patrolling the beaches and telling people in a dystopian way, stay off the beach, go back home, socially distance, and recorded messages. But all of this happening at the same time as mounting pressure occurs in your neck of the woods, what is the latest update on the details that you saw from these articles about what's happening in California with the reopening. I mean, the, 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 the funny thing is, is that they're making a big deal like, oh, we're finally reopening California. This is, this is such good progress. Well, you know, the, the first point I want to make is the statistics haven't really changed that much over the last week. Uh, you know, so clearly to me, it's showing he's, he's feeling the pressure. I mean, Californians are starting to up, starting to uprise. Californians are starting to say, Hey, come on, this is, this is getting ridiculous. We're on day, what number 50 some odd number of days that we've been on lockdown. It's, it's a little much. Um, now, you know, I'm looking at the LA times article right now and, and he, and here's how they're saying that we're going to be reopening California over, over the next week. All right. Under, under the new statewide COVID-19 guidelines, the governor said bookstores, music stores, toy stores, florists, sporting goods retailers, and others can reopen for pickup. So you can't go into the stores. You can drive up to the curb, and they can hand you uh, your order that you're going to call in ahead of time uh, and do that. And then also manufacturing and logistics can resume in the retail supply chain. But like it's like – that's not really a reopening. Like, like literally, what has changed? I can go buy toys at at a curb. I can't even shop. Like, how, how are you supposed to buy toys for your kids when you when you like most people are going in? They're looking to see, hey, kid, what do you want? Not like, hey, we're we're gonna call ahead and I want I want this uh, random toy made of plastic made in China. And then can you hand it to me at the curb? Like, it just seems like everything is totally backwards, and it's literally much ado about nothing. We're, we're in all reality, we're no closer to reopening than uh, than we were before. Now, you said before we started the podcast, it is your belief that uh, the governor of California is going to keep these type of draconian lockdowns going until a vaccine becomes available. And he's already stated that these lockdowns could last in California anywhere from 12 to 18 months. you have any uh, thoughts on that to follow up? Well, yeah. So uh, Governor Newsom has, have, has said uh, that he, you know, because we're, basically we're going through this four step, four phase plan in order to reopen California. Um, and so this, this Friday we're heading into phase number two, which, you know, again, is practically no different than phase number one. Um, but what he, what he did say was that uh, the shelter in place order that we have to where we can only leave our house if we're going to a specific place for a specific reason, mm -hmm. that will be in effect until a vaccine uh, is available which then is gonna come into, are they going to require that everybody gets the vaccine? Uh, more, they're holding out for, for, Bill, for Bill Gates's vaccine, and then you start getting the question, what's in that thing? Why are we gonna be on lockdown for 18 months until that vaccine specifically is available when Israel's coming out with a vaccine, should be ready in four to six weeks. But we can't use that one, we have to hold out for Bill Gates. So what's in Bill Gates's vaccine that they're holding out to so much uh, and then I'm sure they're going to require us all to get. And then it's like, do we take it? Uh, I, I don't think so. Not not from, from not from my perspective. Friend of mine said, 
isn't it interesting that all this stuff seems to occur and then when you look at uh, the end of days, Jesus talks about when you see that trouble coming, flee to the mountains. I think there's a lot of people now that are thinking, oh, I might want that, that, that mountainside cabin out in Montana or Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, or just to get away from all the crazy that is about to happen. But yeah, I'm with you. The, what's in the vaccine? Uh, me and, uh, me and uh, my wife, the Amen Corner, we have decided that this, we're not, <laughs> she's giving me a thumbs down right now. We're not taking this. Uh, I, now, I'm. It, it's not because of any conspiracy theory that I have. I just, I believe that I already had it. I feel like I should eat healthy and let my body fight this off myself. Uh, and I have the antibodies already. If I already had it, we'll, we'll get testing next week to make sure of that. But on principle, I've never trusted even getting a flu vaccine as I've gotten older because I saw how, okay, 70% of people it takes, but 30%, they get sicker than a dog when they get shot with it because they have an adverse reaction. They actually get the flu by taking the vaccine. I don't, I don't trust this as well. And uh, on principle, I'm just not going to do it. Uh, so if you're going to make me have to take it, uh, I'm, I'm not going to comply. I'm just not, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to take your digital mark. I'm just not. Yeah. Well, you know, he, here's the thing is, is I, I remember when all of, when all of this coronavirus was, was barely getting started. I don't know if you I don't know if you remember, but there there was a week when there were something like 20 CEOs resigned from their companies, all major corporations, including Bill Gates. Remember, he, he stepped away as like chairman of the board of Microsoft or, or right, whatever right. that was. And that was all within that week where all the CEOs, including Bob Iger from Disney, uh, it, it, I think it was the was it the either the Uber or Lyft one, there was a bunch of CEOs. They all stepped away at like the same time. And I remember thinking like, what's going on here? Like something seems like, like you don't have 20 or 30 CEOs all step down at the same time. And then coronavirus comes and then you start seeing Bill Gates going out and pushing, uh, pushing vaccines, push, pushing his, you know, kind of globalist agenda and all that kind of stuff. Uh, my wife just handed me the list of all the CEOs who resigned within the same week. Get this. I mean, I, this is fascinating. The CEO of Disney, Nestle, Lockheed Martin, IBM, Microsoft, Hulu, LinkedIn, eBay, MasterCard, Volkswagen, Harley-Davidson, T-Mobile, MGM, Nissan, and more all resigned at the same time, all leading up to coronavirus. And then you start getting into why did that happen? Honestly, I, th I think what's happening is a lot of these guys knew what was, knew what was coming. Uh, they saw the writing on the wall. And now what they're really pushing is they're really pushing for these vaccines, for the, the globalist agenda, for the UN, for the WHO, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy when you start diving into a lot of stuff and what's going on behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, I mean, who, who knows what's going to be next really, in all reality? Well, what's happening right now in reality, sadly, is that uh, we're keeping the abortion mills open. We're letting... Uh, we're letting criminals out of jail and we're putting hard working men and women who need to support their families in jail. That leads me to our next story. Which, which, which also, to interrupt, leads me to my mug. I can't even. Yes, nice. Exactly. I can't even mug. Yeah, we can't even deal with this BS right now. Uh, but we're trying to keep our head above water, which is what we're doing here at the America Held Hostage podcast. So continue to like, subscribe, share it with a friend because some of this, some of these stories are just not getting out. And this is from hard news sites. This is what gets me the reviews that I get from friends and family and listeners saying, OK, well, this is on CNBC or this is on Fox News. Why aren't they reporting it? Because they want to pan, they because they want to peddle the panic porn to you. Because that's what dri that's what's driving their ratings. They're not giving you news; they're giving you infotainment. That's what they're doing. Yeah. But our next story, talking about putting hardworking people in jail, comes to us from theblaze.com. Uh, Sarah Gonzalez, who works at the Blaze, she hosts. Uh, the News and Why It Matters podcast, she tweeted out, 
A judge told Shelley Luther, uh, the salon owner in Dallas County, Texas, who opened her business in defiance of the governor's orders, that she had the option to avoid jail if she admitted to the government that she was wrong and selfish for opening. I want you to hear this firsthand. This is absolutely appalling. Proceed. Judge, I would like to say that I have much respect for this court and laws. And that I've never been, been in this position before. And it's not some place that I want to be. But I have to disagree with you, sir, when, I, when you say that I'm selfish. Because feeding my kids is not selfish. I have hairstylists that are going hungry because they'd rather feed their kids. So, sir, if you think the law is more important than kids getting fed, then please go ahead with your decision, but I am not going to shut the salon. Jeff, I think that woman has the largest set of balls in America that we have seen since probably the Revolutionary War when it comes to patriotism against tyrannical government. But on another level and another plane, sadly, she has more spiritual scrotum than a lot of churches and a lot of pastors that are leading those churches right now. This is an indictment on a lot of men that are saying that they're for constitutional conservative principles and they're not willing to go to jail and open up their their stores and defy the courts and the law because I need to make this point too. We believe since 1890 that courts make law based on precedent with stare decisis. Courts do not make law. Courts give opinions on their cases and then they... they it, they interpret the law and render an opinion on those individual cases. The thing is, is that we haven't recalled federal judges since the Jackson administration, even though that should be happening by and large right now, especially with crap like this. And we haven't, we've operated off stare decisis since 1890. And now a lot of people in our law schools and who are practicing, have general practice uh, law offices, they believe that the courts make law. Courts are not supposed to make law. Courts interpret the law and give an opinion. This man is rendering a, an unconstitutional edict. Beca and that's precisely one of the reasons why the founders in the Revolutionary War fought against the judges and the tyranny that was happening because there was unjust justice that was being doled out to the colonists. There was one set of law for the people that were in the high places, and then there was another set of law for the plebeians. Well, that's one of the reasons why they left England and came to, the, and came to America, and then it was another reason why the colonists rebelled. This woman, sadly is showing more patriotism, more constitutional liberties, more principles for freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, and freedom to address her grievances before her government. And uh, then most conservative principles, and like I, or most conservative pundits. And uh, it, it's, it's sad and it's appalling. And what's even more frightening is that a lot of pastors are not doing this either. I say more cowbell. I'm glad that she went from 15000 last night on her GoFundMe to over 145000 before I went to bed last night. People are just appalled and outraged in America. If this is the first shot, if this is Lexington and Concord, if this is the first shot, this is more cowbell. You need to take her stand and make it your own and start taking your country back. Yeah, well, and and this is one of those this is one of those things as well where we 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 need 
governments, we need local governments, state governments, and and even the federal government to start saying, we don't care what judges say if they are going to be activist judges. If they are going to be, if they think that they can create law, they are in the wrong. And And this is the problem is that we're seeing uh, I believe it was Senator Schumer was making a big deal about this is all Trump's fault that we don't have enough tests and all that kind of stuff. It's not Trump's job to create law. It's not his job to be king. It's his job to execute the law that the legislative branch passes. And it's the same thing with these judges. The judges are not there to make law. The judges are there in order to judge according to the laws that are actually constitutionally uh, you know, passed. And that's the problem that we're having right now is that all of these stay-at-home orders were done, in my opinion, illegally, unconstitutionally. They're taking away people's constitutional rights. The judges are playing into it. The legislative branch is playing into it. Everybody's just following along. At a certain point, we have to remember the actual ultimate law is the Constitution of the United States. So we as Americans, we follow the Constitution. If there's a law that's passed and it's unconstitutional, that law is illegal. Thus, if if a police officer is implementing an illegal law, that police officer is no longer acting under his authority. He takes an oath in order to uphold the Constitution. He does not take an oath to uphold the edicts coming out of a governor's office. And, and that's something that we as America need to remember. Yeah, an unjust law is no law at all if it goes against the laws of nature and nature's God. Um, and the founding document of the Declaration of Independence is what was the precursor and laid the foundation to the Constitution. Um, is, our Constitution is, is a Constitution of a government of, for, and by the people, made up of we the people. So um, I it, ultimately, these judges, these elected officials, they report to us. We're their boss. We don't bow before them and we need to make that known. And if you have elected officials in state, local, federal government, that they aren't going to stand up against this type of tyranny, then you need to vote them out of office and you need to run for office yourself. It starts local. You need to take your school boards back. You need to take your city halls back. You need to take your uh, your your city councils back. Um, uh, th- wherever you're, wherever you can have influence in your neck of the woods, start doing it. And if you start small, you're going to be able to to build out from there. And it only takes it it it, it all you it, you saw yeah. It, over the weekend, it only takes a small, large minority to affect change. How many were there in Huntington Beach in your backyard? 5,000, 10,000 when they protested on Friday and people were starting to go to jail? Well, that raised some eyebrows in California. Okay, well, that wasn't the entire state. That was just a vocal minority that made their voice heard because ultimately a lot of people, Jeff, you and I know this, a lot of people are not going to be strong enough to fight. It's going to be the people that are the 10, 15, maybe 20, 25% that are the large vocal minority that's going to fight for the other 50% that are really apathetic. They want their way of life, but they really don't want to get involved. Well, then you're going to have to fight for them, tooth and nail. Yep. Well, and and that too. That I mean that that those numbers totally line up with uh with the numbers of the Revolutionary War as well. Um, you know, it's like what half 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 of the people in the colonies didn't care, and then and then twenty five percent were loyal to England, and then twenty five percent wanted wanted to break away. So those numbers directly line up with that. It, it was a very vocal minority that actually created America, uh, you know, and broke away from England. So that's something that we need to remember as well. Right. And if you look back statistically, it was the it was almost the same numbers of uh, Americans right before Pearl Harbor and even after, immediately after that. Only twenty five percent wanted to go to war. Fifty percent were apathetic. Another 
25 percent, uh, they actually sided with Europe and said that it was their problem. So uh, it's never the mind, it's never the majority that ever brings about any positive change. The majority is always a mob mentality when it comes to a pagan, fallen, and totally depraved generation. And if you don't believe me, look at the crowd outside Lot's house, and look at the crowd that cried out for Barabbas, and then look at the crowd that said, Greatest Diana, Artemis of the Ephesians! That's all you need to know. Your social media mob and your pagan leftists are the same people that cried out in those mobs too. Whenever they cry out, they always want to do it to destroy you and your way of life. It's a vocal minority, like a Gideon with 300 men that take down the 120,000 Philistines. It's always the Caleb and the Joshua who they get to go and storm the land and take the land of Israel. It was the other 10 spies that weren't allowed to go in and that entire generation had to die off because they weren't willing to obey and they had too small of a view of God. You want to start taking your country back, you're going to have to realize you're a vocal minority. But God can do much with very little. Just look at David and five smooth stones when he stood against Goliath. Our next story, uh, our daily Joe Biden update. I love this. Uh, he had a comment that I want you to hear, Jeff, where he said, the pandemic that this president has no intercourse whatsoever with the rest of the world. That's verbatim. It makes absolutely no sense, but I want you to hear it. This pandemic. The pandemic is that the president has no intercourse whatsoever with the rest of the, country, the, uh, the world on dealing with these things. We led, like Barack Obama led in the uh, corona, I mean, excuse me, in, 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 in the pandemic that occurred when we were in office. It was kept in Africa. We organized the world. We put things together. I have no idea what he's trying to say. Your thoughts, Jeff? Um, I mean, he's slurring his words. He can't, he can't remember anything. He's, stu he's, he's stumbling over every, every three words. He's stumbling over his words. I mean, he can't remember. I, I don't even think he rem remembers where he is. I mean, at a certain point, when are, when, when are the Democrats going to realize that this guy cannot be president? Like, even if, even if you don't want Trump, you've got a guy that clearly is, is showing signs of dementia you want him dealing with Putin? You want him dealing with China? You want him to lead the charge on all of this kind of stuff and he can't even remember anything? Like that that's the thing that's mind-boggling to me. How how are people still supporting this guy? How does Hillary Clinton endorse the guy for president? How does how does anybody endorse this guy for president when he can't even remember what word he just said three seconds ago? Like that, this is completely mind-boggling to me. It is for me too. I, I I can't believe what's happening right now. It is uh, it's appalling. But uh, although, Evan, although this this could be Hillary Hillary Clinton's way to become president of the United States, she becomes the VP. He gets in. He clearly is not fit to be president. They take him out. He he come or she comes in as the president of the United States. She gets her lifelong dream of being the first woman president. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, I find this interesting, a little bit of a contradiction that I saw with some stories that were going on. Um, Dr. Anthony Fauci says there's evidence very strongly that the virus did not originate in a Wuhan lab. But then we hear from Secretary Mike Pompeo that there's significant evidence that the coronavirus originated in a Wuhan lab. So, who's right? Dr. Fauci or the Secretary of State? I mean, are, are, are we talking about the same uh, Dr. Fauci who, who uh, has financial ties with the lab? Are we talking about the same Fauci who's got ties to the WHO, which covered for China? We're we talking to the, the same Fauci 
who has been undermining uh, President Trump every step of the way? I mean, to me, it's a pretty easy answer. We're going to go with uh, Mike Pompeo on this one. I mean, clearly, Fauci has some uh, has some interesting conflicts of interest, I'd say. I don't even know how he's how he's still in a position of leadership right now uh, with all of his conflicts of interest. But what what do I know? Yeah, what do we know? What do we know indeed? I uh, I don't like the fact that uh, Dr. Fauci is uh, heading policy now and is actually contradicting our intelligence gathering resources, but I think we all know that he has ulterior motives and really could care less. Also, but, fo follow, follow the money. You'll probably see he's a lot more involved with that lab than we even realized that at this moment. For for all for all that we know, he could he could be trying to cover his tracks. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, wanted to get to another story that I thought was interesting. The founder of Politico and the Hill had this to say in a letter to the editor to the New York Times talking about Tara Reid's sexual assault allegations against Joe Biden. Said, I totally disagree with this editorial. I don't want an investigation. I want a coronation of Joe Biden. Would he make a great president? Unlikely. Would he make a good president? Good enough. Would he make a better president than the present occupant? Absolutely. I don't want justice, whatever that may be. I want to win. The removal of Donald Trump from office. And Mr. Biden is our best chance. Suppose an investigation reveals damaging information concerning his relationship with Tara Reid or something else, and Mr. Biden loses the nomination to Senator Bernie Sanders or someone else with a minimal chance of defeating Mr. Trump. Should we really risk the possibility? I'm glad that they're taking the masks off, Jeff. Just be honest, because as Martin Luther once said, I would rather have an honest adversary than a dishonest ally. I mean, they, they would nominate Harvey Weinstein if, if they thought he had a chance of beating Trump. That, that I mean, this shows the utter hypocrisy of the left. I mean, you know, wh whenever it's a Republican or somebody on the right where there's accusations almost always falsely accused, you know, cough, cough, Brett Kavanaugh, um, it's it's believe all women. As soon as it's a Democrat, as soon as it falls as soon as it goes against them, all of a sudden we need due process. Actually, we don't even need process at all. We need to – it doesn't matter if he's a rapist. It doesn't matter if he deserves to go to prison. If he can beat Trump, if he can beat that orange man in, in office, uh, th then we'll, we'll rally against anybody. Um, like literally I, – like I feel like we, we – they would literally nominate Jeffrey Dahmer if they thought that he had a chance of beating Trump. That's literally how twisted the left is right now is they don't care about how sinful – about how illegal their leaders uh, behave. Look at Hillary Clinton. Look at James Comey. Look at now. Look at Joe Biden. They don't care about their past. They don't care if they're doing illegal behavior. All they care about is winning. And the the guy from Politico flat out said it. That's insane. Yeah, I I it's hard for me to it's hard for me to uh, understand. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that when it comes to them taking off the masks, they are, uh, they're literally exposing everything that they are right now. Absolutely everything. So uh, I'm glad that Martin uh, Tolchin is, uh, is, is honest. He doesn't want the truth. He just wants power. And that's precisely what this has been about all along. It's been about power. The U.S. Daily Mail reported that Walmart received $12.6 million in federal health stimulus cash, but then they returned it. So they were a part of uh, they were a part of the big stimulus bailout program. Why is the top Fortune 500 company getting $12.6 million from the government, Jeff? Why did the Los Angeles Lakers get four and a half million dollars? Same. Th I mean, like, like that. That's the pr that's the problem with all of this kind of stuff. It, there's so much corruption right now going on with all of this. We shouldn't even be in this situation in the first place. Like, 
the economy shouldn't be shut down. We shouldn't be giving out handouts. We should not go and be we should not be heading towards socialism, which is literally what we're under right now. All of this is just bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. And uh, I mean, if if anything, we never should have been on lockdown. We should have been open the entire time and then take precautions to protect the, the most vulnerable, the people with cancer, diabetes, lung disease, all that kind of stuff. We never should have needed any of these repercussions. We never should have needed any of these solutions. Like the whole thing is just a is a, is an entire mess uh, that never should have happened in the first place. I think we are going to find out that this lockdown was the greatest. It was the greatest hoax in American history. It wasn't needed. We're going to find out there was so much corruption, so many ties to money and power, and it was a lot of uh, a much ado about nothing, but it destroyed people's lives in the process. And when that truth comes out, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be pissed off. Um, yep. And uh, long term, uh, I, I'm worried. I'm worried when that when that truth comes out because as depraved and fallen as we are, people don't like their stuff being taken away. They, they ultimately don't want to be told, well, you can't do this. You, you can't go here. You can't go there. And uh, – uh, this, so, is, this, is, this is no longer America. That's the thing. America was founded on a, a common principle of freedom and liberty. Like, you know, it, it's, it was it, – our nation was founded on the government isn't going to tell you what you do. You do your thing. The government will protect you. The government's job is to protect your rights and then, de and then to defend our country from, from other foreign countries that seek to destroy us. The government's job here in America was founded not to tell you what to do. That was the whole point of this was getting away from having a king that dictates to you how you do how you run your life. And so this oh, kind but, of behavior but, but our bureaucrats and our elected leaders, they look at you guys as all of us as plebeians. Oh, you will bow down to the chocolate bunny. OK, you will bow down to our graven image. You will worship before the altars of state. They could care less about what our founders founded 247 years ago. They or 244 years ago. Uh, rough estimate. Yeah, they they will make you care. I, they want power and control. They want power and fire, control. Fire them all. That's yes. What I'd say. Fire than a yes. Man. And for the for the love of everything holy, get Jared and Ivanka Trump out of the White House because inside sources are saying ninety percent of the White House is saying that Trump is doubling down on the dumb when it comes to allowing these states to extend their lockdowns and to keep the coronavirus task force going. No, you need to reopen the country because you're you're going to lose the election. You keep this up. When 72% of uh, listeners to a conservative talk show say that Trump isn't doing enough to reopen the country, you're losing your base. And that should be greatly concerning to the president because eventually he keeps these going. He'll go to places that are favorable, but eventually he's going to find out that some of his, some of his rallies in favorable places – He's. Uh, I think he, if he keeps the he keeps this stuff up, he's going to start hearing boos. He's going to start getting questions like, "What are you doing to get us back to our way of life?" And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the cult of personality is so big that he can do no wrong within uh, within MAGA country. I don't think that that's the case. I think that he's slowly losing losing his grip on his base. And he still has time to win them back. But stop listening to Fauci and Burks and all these other people who don't have the best interests of the Constitution in mind. They worship at the altar of science. They worship at the altar of health, of Mother Earth. This, this All that coronavirus panic is, is the new climate change alarmism. 
And that gets to our story that we talked about yesterday, where the guy who did the Imperial College UK data modeling, he got fired. Why? Because he broke, not because of faulty data modeling, which helped the US and the UK implode their economies. It wasn't because of that. It's because he broke lockdown to go, uh, to go bang his married lover. Karma. It's what that is. Sweet, sweet karma. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked, Jeff. A man will always reap what he sows. And as I said with, uh, with Uncle Freight Train in last night's podcast, bring back the tar and feathering because that's what's going to stop this stuff. And the people who are, the tr who are causing these treasonous actions, the James Comeys, the Andrew McCabes, the people in the deep state that really don't care about your freedom and your way of life, bring back hangings at the town square and you'll see this stop right quick. Yeah. Well, one one thing that I want that I wanted to bring up, and, and this is something that I've been kind of you know thinking about wh when it comes to Trump and uh, opening back up the economy and all that kind of stuff. I wonder how much of this is is strategic on his part, and it, and it it could it could play out in his favor and it could backfire, right? But I wonder if because when you think when, when you think about it, he's been deferring to the states throughout this entire time. He's been putting out recommendations. And he's been providing assistance for the states, but he hasn't actually implemented lockdowns himself. He's allowed the states to do it. Now, if you look, if you look at the statistics, the states that are still in lockdown, all Democratic states. The Republican states, for the most part, are opening back up. So then that leads to the question, is he, without, without coming out and saying it, is he playing this game of let's let all the Democratic states implode, show – what our nation would be would look like if we actually allowed the Democrats to control the federal government? Because you look at California, we're imploding. You look at New York, they're imploding. It's look at all New Jersey, so they're imploding. Yeah, exactly. So what if he's allowing the state governors to do what they want to do to show the American people, is this really what you want? Do you really want to elect the Democrats? I, this is what would happen on a nationwide level. So then – I, I would I would agree with that, but then let me counteract with that doesn't answer for Republican Ohio Governor Mike DeWine or Republican Maryland Governor Larry Hogan doing the exact same things. So while I agree with you on the premise that the majority of this strategy is going against Democrats, that doesn't answer for the Republican governors that are that that you're finding out are just as progressive as the liberals. And if you talked to Dan Bongino in Maryland, or if you talked to Dr. Mike Spaulding uh, from the GK Podcast Network in Ohio, they would be adamant that their Republican governors are doubling down on the dumbassery that, say, uh, Andrew Cuomo or Phil Murphy or Gavin Newsom or uh, uh, Governor uh, uh, Blackface uh, KKK Hood Ralph Northam is doing in Virginia. So what do you say – to those governors in Republican states that continue with these draconian lockdowns as well. They're a part of the problem. Like that, that's Absolutely. Ultimately, that's ultimately what it comes down to is they're a part of the problem. And the thing that we as Americans and as conservatives need to remember is that just because somebody's a Republican does not mean that they're a good guy. And, and that's part of the problem. There's a lot of rhinos. There's a lot of people that are Republicans in the deep state. Look at Mitt Romney. Look at McCain when he was alive. Look at the majority of establishment Republicans. They are a part of the problem. They're no different than Democrats. And that's something that we need to remember. We need to be pushing for conservatives, not necessarily Republicans. And this is what this whole fight is about right now, is what kind of nation do we want to be moving forward? Do we want to be a leftist, progressive, socialistic, communist country, or do we want to be a freedom-loving, liberty-minded, a conservative country? That's what this fight is coming down to. And whether you're Democrat or Republican, if you are choosing to go down the socialistic, communistic route, you're a part of the problem. I don't care what party you associate with or you identify with or whatever we want to call it. But the but it, it, this is not this is no longer Democrat versus Republican. This is good versus evil. This is left versus right. This is conservative versus liberal. This is what we need to remember. It's not about whether there's an R or a D. It matters whether you are pushing for constitutional liberty and freedom.
I don't. Uh, you said uh, left versus right. I think it's I think it's right versus wrong. Uh, what type of country do I want? A couple of other stories I wanted to get to before we close up. I don't want a country where Breitbart News is reporting that men accused of raping children among the 830 inmates freed in Massachusetts because of coronavirus fears. That's not the country I want, Jeff. I don't want a country where the National Restaurant Association, according to Brett Baer, is estimating that 15 to 20 percent of restaurants won't survive the coronavirus pandemic. The amount of small businesses that are going to go under, the amount of servers that aren't going to have jobs, the amount of cooks that won't have jobs, the amount of places that you're not going to be able to get a steak dinner and be able to enjoy some freedom and some liberty that comes about in the greatest nation that God has ever blessed man with. And you just did that. That's not the country I want. Is that the country you want, yep. Jeff? Not at all. You know, the thing is, I you know, I've got a lot of friends and and a lot of people that I know that that own businesses. They run small businesses and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, I've I've already had multiple multiple people uh, tell me like they're they're being forced to close up shop. Got multiple emails from companies that we support and like and that sort of thing, and they're they're closing down permanently. They they can't get through this, and especially with with no end in sight. It was one thing. And again, I'm not saying it was right, but it was one thing when the, when it was a two week lockdown, just in order to get enough ICU beds, get a grip on medication and how we're going to handle this, so that way we don't get a, a, an overflow of people heading into ICU, right? But now we're on day what number 53? Like, it's a little excessive, and there's no end in sight in a lot of the in a lot of these states, like like out here in California. That's a that is a problem. Is that there's no end in sight? We don't know where this is going. We don't know what's going to happen, and businesses are like. It's how Afghanistan we, and Iraq all over again. How are we supposed to pay back three months of rent when they're allowing us to push it forward and defer rent? But how are we supposed to have the funds to be able to back pay three months of rent when we had three months of no income? This is absolutely ludicrous that these governors and, and state leaders think that this is the way that we do things. This is not the American way. This is how China does things. This is how Russia does things. This is how the Middle East does things. This is not how a free society is supposed to act. I would agree. To follow up on your point, uh, our idiot governor, uh, Phil Murphy in New Jersey, is saying uh, New Jersey – or NJ.com, their politics section, tweeted out, there's no timetable to reopen from the New Jersey coronavirus lockdowns, quote, whether you like that or not. That's from our governor. He's a moron. I'm just going to say that. Uh, it, uh, J.J. Knight – told me in a private conversation last night, your governor is an idiot. He's a tool. And he is. You, you, can't, you can't tell me we got a, a executive order. Oh, you can use your security deposit towards your rent, but then you have to pay it back within six months after the emergency is declared over. So I'm borrowing from myself now how am I supposed to pay myself back when I don't have a job? It's it's not it's not like our salaries are going to be increased when we get out of this to make up like we're not we're not we're not getting paid back for our lost wages and that's the thing that we have to remember is like okay cool so so uh, people that are renters that are that have an apartment right they can defer their rent like in California you're, you're not allowed to be evicted if you uh, if you can't pay your rent but you still have to pay it back you still owe it. You just you just make it up over the next several months, right? You're not making more money when you get out of this if you even have a job when right. we get out of this. Like, like how in the world is this the right way to handle this? And on top of that, the thing we have to remember is that this is affecting people in the middle class to lower class the most because they have the least amount of wiggle room in their income. Most people are living – Paycheck to paycheck, and all of a sudden now we're we're going to be doubling, tripling their expenses coming out of this. And if they even have a job, this is ludicrous. It is ludicrous. What's also ludicrous is Lisa Booth of Fox News said in New York City, the epicenter of the coronavirus, the death rate for people between the ages of eighteen to forty-four, Jeff, is point zero one six percent. And the hospitalization rate is 0.18%. What 
Why aren't we sending low-risk people back to work? Millennials alone account for one-third of the labor force. Those stats are from the New York City Department of Health. Yeah. What we're doing is ludicrous. It's asinine. Um, I firmly believe this is not going to be a V-shaped recovery. We've heard from Fox News, from traders that said that when the oil markets collapsed, those prices were indicative that you're going to see the bottom hit at about 10,000 because that's where the oil market levels, the futures were trading at. Now we're seeing that we're, we're already uh, two weeks away from beef, uh, beef and meat shortages that will last another 12 to 18 months in places and it's going to affect the entire country because – it's not the fact that, oh, well, I thought Trump fixed it because he used the Defense Production Act to keep those places open. No. Outback Steakhouse is closed. You can't get a steak. Your schools are closed. They're not making enough hamburger. You have too much demand and not – or you have too much supply, not enough demand. So where is all that oil going to go? That's why your gas prices are so low. Where's all that beef going to go? Well, eventually, they're going to have to euthanize the chicken the cows, the pigs, because they don't have enough room and enough places, they don't have enough demand to be able to bring those to term and it costs more to produce it than it is to, well, let's just get rid of it, keep it in the ground, uh, let's put it down and then we can just fire this stuff back up when we need to. But then it takes longer for it to occur. It takes Like we said in the last podcast, for poultry, it's six to eight weeks. For hogs, it's six to eight months. For cattle, it's 12 to 18 months. You shut that down, you shut down the link, you're going to see more family farms that are going to go out of business. You're going to see uh, more uh, local convenience stores that are going to go out of business. You're going to see more local restaurants that are going to go out of business. And there's a huge wave that's coming. Yeah. And I don't under I don't think we understand between now and the end of the year the pain that we've inflicted on ourselves. And that pain is going to continue to go longer and longer the longer these lockdowns occur. Which is why I'm looking forward to get it, getting out of New Jersey as quick as possible because there's un, there's going to be other places that are going to rebound. They're going to rebound quickly and they're going to have more freedom and more liberty. But these other places that continue with these means, they're going to have, they're going to have rebuilding and recovery efforts for years. Yeah, and 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 I hope that too is that coming coming out of this that uh, that in general the economy and and the business model will change. I know we've talked a lot about uh, going small business and and that sort of thing, but uh, you know the the farms that are being successful right now and they're not going under are the ones that do direct to consumer uh, sales they're they're So the reason why a lot, a lot of the bigger farms, they're really struggling is because they're selling their meat at a whole, at a lower than wholesale price to a distributor who then is selling it to Outback Steakhouse, mm -hmm. as opposed to the, the farmers that are slaughtering cows. And then they're selling it at retail prices directly to the consumers at home. Like we just, we just uh, got an order of, of meat shipped to us directly from a farm that we, that we get it from. And they ship it directly to us. They're making, you know, double or triple per unit what uh, what other farmers are getting when they just sell it to a distributor. If if local if we can start supporting local farms, we can support them. Then when there's a big pandemic like this that happens, they're not going to go under because they can they can continue to keep going through work. And this is how we're supposed to be doing things: support local, stop supporting the big national chains and the big corporations and things like that. Support your local small business. Then when something like this happens. Not everybody's going to go under. True. If you can find a local business that's still open right that's now. Good point. Yeah. I wanted to close with a funny story and then uh, my closing thoughts. Uh, <laughs> this, this comes to us from GellerReport.com. She linked to a story from the American Thinker. Camel urine, Islam's best cure for coronavirus. I kid you not. Muslim advocacy for drinking camel urine is back in the news, this time with a connection to coronavirus, which is especially ironic, if not deadly, as will be explained. 
an Islamic medicine specialist and director of religious scientific institution in Iran, recently called on his countrymen to drink camel urine as the best cure for coronavirus and other ailments. Mehdi Sabili, who is affiliated with the Iranian regime, uploaded a video to his Instagram extolling the virtues of, uh, of drinking camel piss on April 19th. The video, which has since gone viral, depicted him drinking a glass of, quote, warm and fresh urine and calling on Iranians to do the same three times a day for a full nine glasses. Where does the idea come from? As usual with everything in Islam, the drinking of camel urine is traced back to Muhammad. It's considered uh, uh, part of the Hadith or uh, part of the canon in Islamic tradition as the prophet med medicinally described the ingestion of camel piss to help you with, he with your own ailments. It's also considered a great blessing and a safeguard you from the fires of hell. Your thoughts as we find out, Jeff, that uh, Islam says camel urine can keep you from hell and keep you from coronavirus. You don't need the blood of Christ. You just need some camel piss. Um, reason number 5,769 why I'm glad I'm not a Muslim. <laughs> I, I can't, just like your mug, I can't even with this story. But I think it's hilarious. Yeah. So as we close up, there were some great quotes that I want to that I want to finish up with as my closing thoughts. We talked about uh, it doesn't take a majority to prevail. Sam Adams said, "It doesn't take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority, keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men." That's what we're trying to do here at the GK Podcast Network. That's what we're trying to do in particular with this show, America Held Hostage. Also, talking about Dr. Fauci, well, it didn't come from a lab. Secretary of State Pompeo saying, well, it did come from a lab. G.K. Chesterton said, it often happens that science arrives eventually at a truth which common sense has discovered without its aid a long time before. And then when it comes to the power hungry, like our governors, Governor Murphy and Governor Gavin Newsom. G.K. Chesterton said, To the vindictive man, it is vain to offer reparation. For he doesn't desire reparation, he desires his wrongs. Vindictiveness is a disease. And when it is once generated, it rages, not only until it has killed its enemies, but until it has also killed its possessor. Just like Gollum, with my precious. It ultimately destroyed him. But I end with this quote from G.K. Chesterton as well in my Way It Should Be commentary. He said, The false theory of progress maintains that we alter the test instead of trying to pass the test. I think that says all we need to hear today as you see people that are saying, Oh, it was... Uh, 15 days to flatten the curve, 30 days to slow the spread. Now we've got to st stay on lockdown because otherwise there's going to be a second wave. Well, is there any timetable for when we return to normal? No, there's no timetable. We we've got to trust the data and the science. My governor is saying data drives dates. And I said herd immunity builds economic community. That's where I close. Because if you don't start pushing back on this and starting those brush fires in the minds of men, as Samuel Adams told us we need to, you're going to lose your freedoms in your country. It's time for you to take your country back, and it's time for you to take your churches back. And it's time to start asking your elected leaders and those in uh, leadership in your churches some hard questions about where we go moving forward. Your final thoughts as we close out, Jeff. Yeah, I think uh, for me, it, all of this comes back to 
uh, you know, we, we've been having a debate, especially with uh, when Bernie Sanders was still, you know, running for president and that sort of thing about, you know, do we want to be a socialist country? How much socialism do we want? And that sort of thing. And then, you know, as conservatives, we always point to like places like Venezuela or Russia or China or, you know, any of these places where like, see, see like how it is over there. Like, you know, those countries, how bad it is. We don't want that here. Well, this is this is our taste of socialism. This is our taste of communism. And what's what's been fascinating to me is in a lot of these liberal leftist states, how many people are like, yeah, I'll take it. Like, like that's not American to, to want this kind of uh, tyranny, to want this t- kind of governmental oversight. And I, th- and I think that as conservatives, the thing that we need to come back to and that we really need to point to is this, this is truly a taste of socialism. And as conservatives, obviously, we don't like this. Use this as motivation to go out there and articulate true conservative principles to to uh, voice our support of the Constitution of the United States, why it's so important. Use this as motivation moving forward, heading into the 2020 election, not to allow this to happen again. If you have a governor that is choosing socialism right now as a response to COVID-19, vote them out. If you have a legislative branch that is voting to support their governor and their executive orders that are taking away your constitutional rights, vote them out. Find the right people, put them into office, people that are constitutionalists, people that are promoting freedom, people that are promoting liberty. Use this as motivation heading into the 2020 election, into the 2022 election, into the 2024 election. Don't forget, like when we're 10 years down the road, don't forget 2020 and the year that socialism was actually tried in America. Don't ever forget this. Use this as motivation well, well, well into the future to make sure that we always preserve our freedom and liberty. And, you know, like we said after 9-11, never forget. Use, use 2020 as an opportunity to never forget what socialism could do to our country. It's nearly destroying us, and we need to make sure that this never happens again. I would agree. Let me follow up by saying uh, personally uh, to you, what would you be saying to uh, uh, church leaders and pastors uh, in light of this coronavirus uh, fear porn uh, and, and panic pandemic? Uh, re- realize that your loyalty lies to God, number one, it does not lie with your local governor. That that is key, and and I and for for me for me personally, I tend to leave a little bit of wiggle room in into what pastors can actually decide for their local congregations, and you know because you know there's different um, you know age ranges with different churches, and you know you need to you need to figure out what works best for you on a, on a specific level. But when it comes to overall, don't just roll over when the government comes and tells you to shut down. Don't just don't just take what the government tells you and then say, Romans 13 tells me I have to submit. Like, no, you're supposed to submit to actual legitimate law. You're supposed to, you're supposed to submit to good, positive law that's supporting the Bible. Your loyalty is with God first. I was just reading in Acts this morning in my morning devotions and, you know, where it is the first few chapters and literally the disciples are saying, to, to the apostles are saying to their government leaders, we don't answer to you. We answer to God. We're not going to stop preaching the gospel. We're not going to stop you know, preaching the name of Jesus Christ. And that's something that I think that the pastors need to remember is that in the book of Acts, look at how the, the apostles dealt with the local, the local authorities. They, they treated them with respect. They treated them with respect because they were in positions of leadership. But when push comes to shove, their loyalty lies with God and God's word more than the local government and the tyrannical laws that they're passing trying to shut down our freedom and liberty. We are, as we close up, I'm reminded that in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, we hear that uh, uh, we hear Peter telling us to be subject to the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is God's will, that by doing so you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, 
love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Now the thing is, is it says you are to uh, be subject to the Lord's sake to those who punish evil and praise good. What happens when they praise evil and punish good? That's my question. So as we close out, uh, remember that uh, you can reach us at America Held Hostage Podcast at gmail.com. And you can also find us at uh, jhinton underscore. You can also see us at uh, gatekeepersonline.com. You can find Jeff at Jeff the GK on Twitter. You can find me at jhinton underscore as well. So for Jeff Dornick, I'm John Hinton. This has been the America Held Hostage Podcast on the GK Podcast Network. Until next time, that's the way it should be. Colossians, you wait.